I'm so glad you could all be here with us today. Um, before we dive in, I just want to thank a few of the many people that you've seen running around making this whole event possible. Um, first, I want to acknowledge my colleagues, Stephanie Luce, Samir Santi, and Alan Dickner, all of whom are in the room somewhere. Um, the four of us started dreaming up this uh, event last fall and have been working pretty hard to make it a reality. Um, many of the events that are held in this room are put together by SLU's public programming staff, but once in a while, this is the first time in three years, um, we have a faculty organized conference, and this is one of those. Um, the last one we planned was in um, May 2020, so as you might imagine, it was not held in this room but online, but um, now we're back. Um, so you'll hear from all four of us in the course of the day. We're sharing the various sessions. I want to also thank the staff who worked so hard to make this event possible, many of whom are here today. A special call, I can't name everybody, but there, I want to call out a few people in particular, Marie Romani, um, Michael Lallan, who's handling all the technical logistics, and Suzette Ellington. Also to the maintenance staff who will keep us um, from making too much of a mess. Um, I also want to thank Mark Kagan, who's here somewhere, who contributed a tremendous amount of support for getting this together. Um, some of you have heard from him, if you're speaking here today, um, in dealing with the formidable CUNY bureaucracy. Okay, so let me just share a few thoughts by way of introduction, and then we'll move right into the first panel. I'm going to try to keep this short since we're already behind schedule. Um, like, you still can't hear me. I can't believe this. Now? Is it better? All right, I'll hold on to it. So, like many others um, present today and maybe listening online, the four of us planning this conference were initially imagining this event as something that would focus on the high-profile organizing in the labor movement that's been happening over the past couple of years, which I'm sure everyone here is aware of, especially among younger workers. Um, we've all been preoccupied with that, as I'm sure some of you have too. Um, and media attention to these iconic companies being organized like Starbucks, Amazon, et cetera, has um, amplified it enormously despite the rather modest numbers of workers involved in the unrelenting employer resistance. We, this is part of the conversation today, but we decided to try to put it in a larger context. Um, and so um, the program is much broader than that. However, we are going to start with that piece, and this panel is about organizing. Um, Eric Blank's wonderful presentation will convince you, if you have any doubts, that something important and new is happening um, in this new wave of organizing, which he calls do-it-yourself labor organizing. Um, he and I and many others have pointed out that the workers involved in these efforts are disproportionately young and college educated, and there are reasons for that. You've probably seen the polling data suggesting that that demographic is particularly pro-union, although public support generally for the labor movement has grown in recent years. Um, the college educated piece, in my view, is key. It reflects a gap between labor market expectations and labor market realities, and you'll hear more about that from Eric. Relatedly, as um, Harold Meyerson recently observed in a piece in the American Prospect, some of you might have seen, in settings where workers are not easily replaced, including higher education, um, is one place that unionism has gained the most traction. Um, graduate student workers, K through 12 workers, who I know Eric will mention, are the most obvious examples, but also doctors, nurses, other professionals, proto-professionals, Meyerson calls them as well. Um, so the ongoing anti-union employer resistance can, can more easily be overcome in those situations. Um, anyway, that surge of new organizing is our starting point, but we're trying to cast a wider net, um, looking also at labor movement growth through more traditional means, which um, Larry Engelstein in particular will speak about on this morning panel. Um, later in the day, we'll be talking about strikes, contracts, collective bargaining, and also the ways in which organized labor's leverage is exerted in the political arena. So the title of the event, How Workers Win, is meant to cast a very broad net. Um, I just want to say one more thing about the kind of potential, the implicit dialogue that's already represented in the program for this morning between Eric Blank's paper on what he calls do-it-yourself unionism, which I've already mentioned, and Larry Engelstein's paper on SEIU 32BJ and its traditional, well, maybe it's not traditional, but its very different growth strategy 
Um, so I hope in the discussion we'll have a chance to reflect on the pros and cons of each. Um, the latter is, in terms of the numbers, is a lot more successful, but I know some of you will have questions about all that. So we'll be looking forward to discussing these side by side. In addition, we have a fascinating piece on organizing in higher education from Kavitha Iyengar, who comes to us from California. And finally, a paper from Tammy Lee and Maite, did I say it right? Oh, finally, Tapia on um, one specific dimension of employer resistance to organizing, which in this case, Amazon's racialized system of labor control in the South, so I know you'll find that quite interesting. Okay. So each speaker will have about 15 minutes to present. I should say exactly 15 minutes to present because we want to make sure there's time for all of you to participate. Um, and we'll go in the order on the program. Biographies for each of our speakers, both this morning and later in the day, are in the printed program, so we are not going to rehearse those here just to save time. Um, though it's a very distinguished panel, so take a look at those biographies. Um, I just want to mention one other thing. Um, with the Q&A, Michael, correct me if there's more to say about this, there will be a microphone available that will move around the room as we, when, you know, so please wait for that rather than calling out a question and we'll call on you. Um, and also, once this session is over, um, we have a very packed program and we have a luncheon speaker, so there will be box lunches outside. Once we're finished here, please grab one grab a drink, come back, because we have a treat for you, which is the NLRB general counsel, Jennifer Abrusa, will be addressing us over lunch. So that's why the box lunches. They may not be gourmet food, but they'll serve the purpose of allowing us to move quickly into that phase of the event. Um, and there will be more schmooze time later in the day. So without further ado, let's get started. We're going to start with Eric Blank. Can you, this is it? You can just hover over this. Okay. And then you, slideshow. Okay. Hi, everybody. Thanks to the organizers for hosting us. I'm going to go quickly because I've got a lot of things to cover. I'm going to try to. Can you hear me? I'm going to try to cover the big findings and arguments for my new book on worker to worker organizing. Uh, and what I call do-it-yourself unionism. Let's see if this works. So what is do-it-yourself unionism? I'm talking about strikes and union drives that are initiated by self-organized workers and or in which workers take on key responsibilities traditionally reserved for union staff. Um, in addition to self-initiated strikes, DIY unionism takes three main organizational forms. We're talking about independent unions like the Amazon Labor Union, um, hybrid unions in which uh, tr more established unions bake in worker-to-worker -worker organizing into their national structures, like Starbucks Workers United and the News Guild. And then finally, drives that begin uh, self-initiated worker drives that end up affiliating with an existing union, such as a majority of the recent graduate student organizing efforts. So to give some sense of why we are seeing something new from below, uh, just keep in mind the 2018 teacher strikes which were the first, teacher, uh, the first strike wave since the 1970s, involving hundreds of thousands of school workers, millions of students, and these were initiated from below by rank and file teachers. The reality is union densities continued to decline, but I think that misses trees somewhat, because there's been a qualitative shift uh, in a lot of areas, including the targets of unionization. So if you look on this, probably hard to read for you, graph. Uh, it's the Fortune 500. Uh, almost Most years since it was founded have had zero, maybe one drive in Fortune 500 companies. 2001 saw three such drives, and 2022 saw eight such drives. So we're looking at union drives targeting much bigger companies than in the past. Um, the fact that these drives have taken on such high-profile companies helps explain why media attention to unionization has skyrocketed, uh, particularly in 2022, as you can see in this graph. Uh, this graph is of Google Analytics, which t allows us to look at the number of people that search for how do I form a union in 2022. And you can see there's a dramatic surge uh, in 2022 compared to years prior. And that big bump you see at the end is from after the Amazon labor union. And that speaks to a uh, dynamic that's going on in which 
what's driving this in large part is a contagion factor in which workers see a success and a fight elsewhere and try to replicate that. So uh, another major impact of this bottom-up drive is the transformation of existing unions. The best example of this is in the United Auto Workers, in which uh, young graduate students provided a margin of victory, allowing an auto worker insurgency to topple uh, an old guard leadership. And it's possible that influx of young radicalized workers into other unions could be a tipping point as well. So what explains the rise in worker-to-worker -worker organizing, DIY unionism? Very quickly, three conjunctural factors have made this an exceptionally favorable moment for labor organizing in general. First, the pandemic. Second, a historically tight labor market. And third, a bold pro-union NLRB. Uh, there are also deeper long-term factors at play, uh, one of the most important of which is the inequalities of neoliberalism. Um, in addition, though, you have the weakness and risk aversion of most national labor unions creating a vacuum that worker-initiated drives are trying to fill. And then finally, you have digital tools and youth radicalization driving DIY unionism. To dig into that a little, uh, digital tools um, have significantly lowered the costs of organizing and communication, thereby increasing the ability of rank-and-file organizers to build worker-to-worker -worker structures both inside and outside of existing unions. As such, workers' dependence on established unions to provide communication resources has lessened. So an example would be the 2018 teacher strikes, which were started by young democratic socialist teachers in West Virginia, creating a viral Facebook group, and that model then spreading to Arizona and Oklahoma. And no less importantly, digital tools have boosted the ability of workers to train other workers nationally to an extent that wasn't possible previously. One of the core innovations of Starbucks Workers United and the News Guild is that it's baked in this type of national worker-to-worker -worker training, both through one-on-ones and in national mass trainings, into the very heart of its campaign. So this digital savviness goes hand in hand with the radicalization of millennials and Gen Z. Union support amongst young people remains consistently highest. And I saw this firsthand, so did Tammy, um, last month where uh, we had a very successful strike. And this is a picture of uh, frat boys uh, at Rutgers. Surprisingly, we're actually supportive of our strike. So yes, something new is in the air. Um, and to get a better sense then of who's driving this labor uptick, I've surveyed for my book so far about 300 uh, organizing committee members of these worker-initiated drives, and I found that a majority consider themselves politically radical, and their top-ranking top political influences are Bernie Sanders and Black Lives Matter. My survey also found that the average age of DIY worker organizers is 27. In comparison, the average age of the AFL-CIO executive board is 61. Turning now to organizing methods, it's important to note that worker-to-worker -worker organizing is not a novel practice in organized labor. If you pick up almost any book uh, on workplace organizing, any handbook in the last 30, 40 years, it's going to tell you you should build a strong organizing committee tasked with reaching out to your coworkers. And uh, Kate Broffenbrenner's really amazing quantitative research has confirmed over and over again that these type of uh, intensive rank-and-file tactics are central to winning union drives. Uh, a minority of national unions and locals have consistently sought to implement these methods, but, and this is the crucial point, the vast majority of union drives for decades have not implemented best organizing practices. And this point has been sadly reconfirmed by Kate's uh, research, which has found that only about 20 to 30 percent of drives since the late 80s have even had active and representative organizing committees. So unlike most DIY, uh, unlike most unions, DIY drives have relied on a wide range of rank and file organizing methods. And my survey data shows that over 90%, for instance, have had active and representative OCs. And indeed, many DIY unionists I've uh, interviewed explicitly frame their efforts as upholding a long-standing uh, left-leaning rank and file oriented organizing tradition as exemplified, for instance, in the writings of Jane McAlevey and Labor Notes. So rather than counterposing momentum organizing to structure-based organizing, recent experience suggests that the former can be a crucial mechanism to boosting the latter. So what then differentiates DIY unionism from traditional unions? Um, two crucial points should be un uh, underscored here. First, as we just saw, DIY drives generally implement the rank and file intensive organizing methods that most national unions have avoided. And second, most decisively, DIY efforts give more initiative and organizing agency to workers, both in comparison with most unions and in comparison with those traditional unions that do implement rank and file intensive uh, organizing tactics. So this increased agency is true for all three of the forms of unionism, DIY unionism that I explained before, not just independent unions. 
What then are the particular strengths of DIY unionism? Um, the first is that young radicalized workers are generally pushing uh, for a strategy that is better, better calibrated for our anti-union neoliberal context uh, than most traditional union strategies of looking for high road companies or trying to uh, lobby Congress into passing a national labor law reform. Experience that shows that you make companies high road by struggle forcing them to go into a high road, and that it's unlikely you're going to get major labor law reform on a national level without significant uh, upsurge in mass struggle from below. Another uh, strength of relying on worker-to-worker -worker organizing is that it helps undercut bosses' ongoing attempts to portray the union as a third party standing between management and workers. And there, there are real drawbacks, which I'll talk at the end about this approach. Uh, increased worker leadership also does tend to foster a culture of democratic unionism. DIY unionization also tends to elicit a higher degree of dedication from worker organizers. The Amazon Labor Union, for instance, won uh, JFK in part because its committee of 10 to 15 workers spent on average 30 to 40 hours for a whole year in addition to their normal work shifts organizing their coworkers. And this high level of dedication poses new openings for organizing in high turnover industries. For the sake of the movement, countless workers have chosen to stick it out at their jobs even in the face of intense manager harassment and demoralizing union busting. So while DIY drives are generally implementing traditional tank rank and file organizing methods. There's also been an increase in experimentation and tactical flexibility, and I've collected a lot of interesting data, and I hope that in the discussion we might have some time to talk about that in the detail it requires, which I don't have here. The final and most important strength of DIY unionism, and I want to underscore this, is that it can scale up. A decrease in organizing costs is a major historical development. A central reason for the impasse of labor's partial turn to new organizing in the 1990s and early 2000s was that it proved to be so resource intensive. DIY drives are proving to be significantly cheaper. Even if financial resources weren't an issue, and the unions do have money, the ability to rapidly diffuse campaigns would remain. Because there are only so many experienced union staffers around at a given time, it's hard for staff-driven efforts to scale up in moments of effervescence. So for example, the Starbucks uh, drive began as a relatively traditional campaign, but it had to transform itself into a DIY worker-to-worker -worker campaign after Buffalo's win unexpectedly sparked a national interest, and they transformed their campaign, bringing a national worker-to-worker -worker structures. If they had relied only on staff, they just wouldn't have had enough people to onboard and train the new workers all across the country that wanted to unionize. None of this is meant to deny that DIY unionism also has major weaknesses. Um, the first limitation is that the inexperience of new organizers can sometimes lead to avoidable tactical mistakes. Second, DIY drives have tended to be concentrated in industries with younger and or college educated workers. Though this is a large and growing section of the working class, most workers today, particularly in black and Latino communities, don't have college degrees. Finding ways to organize non-college educated workers at scale is one of the major challenges facing DIY and traditional unions. Third, the growth of independent unions risks further fragmenting a U.S. labor movement marked already by an extreme degree of organizational atomization and decentralization. And the growth of DIY campaigns uh, that begin self-organized that end up affiliating with established unions, for instance, grad students, also appears to be strengthening a trend of national unions to become general unions instead of focusing on a particular industry. So for instance, I think there's nine different national unions that are organizing graduate student workers today. Um, fourth, momentum can disappear just as quickly as it appears. It's an open question how long the current uptick will last before a recession, uh, union busting, and or Republicans coming back to the White House will extinguish the momentum. Fifth, burnout of overstretched worker organizers is a very, very real problem. Sixth, organizing is cheaper than the past, but it's definitely not free. It still takes a lot of staff and legal resources to support all three forms of DIY drives. As such, fulfilling the full potential of DIY unionism requires a major influx in funding and staff from big national unions. So these are all significant issues, but by far the most important limitation of worker-led drives is simply that, like all other forms of unionization, they don't have a silver bullet capable of overcoming corporate union busting. The path to a first contract remains daunting for those DIY campaigns confronting large corporations such as Starbucks, Amazon, and Apple. Starbucks, uh, for example, largely, the management largely succeeded in 
um, lowering uh, a lot the momentum of their drives by firing dozens of worker organizers and by denying uh, raises and benefits to unionized stores. And because the penalties for scorched earth union busting tactics and bad faith bargaining are so negligible under US labor law, most corporations are going to continue to try to um, stonewall their new unions. Indeed, the daunting prospect and at least in the short term for winning a first contract at these companies is the strongest objection raised by skeptics of the current labor uptick and DIY unionism specifically. And while there is a good deal of merit to this skepticism, it's analytically one-sided and it's strategically unhelpful. First of all, many DIY campaigns have won great first contracts. Look, for instance, at the big wins in media, universities, nonprofits. These results show the potential for a worker to worker drives to win big when they've organized a majority of employees. Furthermore, it's wrong to assume that unionized workers at companies like Starbucks or Amazon can't win significant concessions before achieving a contract. The unionization efforts at Starbucks, for instance, has already uh, forced the company to raise wages nationally to 15 an hour and grant the union's uh, demand for credit card tipping. And partial unions along the way, which have happened at a lot of these other big corporations, are a way for fledgling, long-lasting uh, campaigns to keep up momentum uh, in a marathon organizing drive. And since conditions for unionization currently remain by far the most favorable they've been in decades, it's hard to justify waiting out this moment. Indeed, there's a self-fulfilling prophecy dynamic inherent in labor's continued routinism. Whatever chances DIY drives have of making a breakthrough depends to a significant extent on whether national unions start putting large resources towards new organizing and towards going all out to support drives at places like Starbucks, including, for example, if necessary, organizing pickets at all stores to enforce a national boycott in conjunction with a strike at Starbucks, an idea that some people have floated. And this is certainly a risky bet. There's no guarantees it would work, uh, including a, new, a drive to new organizing and other companies. But it's hard to see how maintaining labor's current orientations can result in anything other than continued decline. And to be clear, my argument isn't that change only comes from disruptive bottom-up movements. We've seen since 2020 how even an underfunded NLRB with weak enforcement powers has been able to successfully uh, support union efforts. To cite one of its many uh, contributions, there wouldn't be a Starbucks drive today very likely if the NLRB hadn't uh, agreed with the union's demand that elections be uh, on a store-by-store -store rather than city-wide basis. A strong majority of DIY worker organizers I've surveyed report that federally recognized union rights, despite lax informant, have been a major factor enabling them to win over their skeptical coworkers. So the NLRA of 1935, while very uh, weak, is still has some signs of life. And the final points I want to make is that more state intervention is necessary, and to make the NLRB in this process actually function. And had Biden and other leading Democrats wanted to seriously pressure corporations to immediately obey labor law, they have mechanisms in which they could do that. They could use their bully pulpit, they could use their ability to withhold uh, contracts from union busting companies. But given the weight of corporate influence over Democratic leaders, unions shouldn't expect establishment Democrats to actually champion labor's cause unless they initiate an escalating disruptive campaign to pressure and force Democratic leaders to actually start trying to implement labor law. And so breaking labor from its deferential approach to the Democratic Party leadership through these types of campaigns and by backing anti-corporate electoral uh, challengers may ultimately be one of the most important tasks facing DIY organizers. To conclude, actually, my big takeaway then is that the growth of DIY unionism shows why labor as a whole should immediately make a major turn towards new organizing. Both traditional and DIY methods are going to be necessary, but only DIY unionism has the potential to win at scale. And there's no guarantee that this turn to new organizing will succeed, but at a minimum, it would likely res uh, win material concessions, increase pressure on state officials uh, to pass labor law reform or to implement current labor law, train thousands of new worker leaders, and accumulate invaluable lessons on what it will take to win big. Thank you. That was an amazing amount to cover in 15 minutes. Thank you, Eric. We'll have time to pick it apart later. Now for a somewhat different point of view, Larry Engelstein. Thank you. Um, I know we'll get to it later, which will be the fun part for you guys and for us. Uh, but there's actually not as much difference as Ruth would like to suggest between Eric and I 
Uh, so this will not, I don't think, be like a wide world of wrestling event uh, uh, for, uh, for TV. Okay, um, I want to make uh, two main points this morning in my limited time. First, that over uh, 32, BG, 32 BJ's last 20 years, uh, of that number, uh, there were 37,281 in cleaning, janitorial, 34,482 in security, 19,825 in airport contracting, which includes guards and uh, cleaners who work at the airport, and 7,840 uh, residential workers, for a total of 99,428 in those four primary sectors of the local. That does not include workers in other classifications that were also organized, and it doesn't include the workers who were organized into the, uh, by locals that merged into 32BJ during that 20-year uh, uh, period or so. The organizing took two main forms, new market-wide or sector by classification, I mean campaigns, and maintaining and expanding union market share in organized markets. There were new market janitorial campaigns in New Jersey, Northern Virginia, Wilmington, Delaware, and Miami-Dade County. These were part-time workers, three or four hours a night, getting minimum wages, little or no benefits, or paid leave with extremely high rates of turnover. Security guard campaigns in New York City, Hartford, Pittsburgh, Philadelphia, the District of Columbia, Baltimore, and New Jersey, and in Miami-Dade County in Florida, and in Connecticut statewide among publicly contracted guards. These campaigns united workers at literally hundreds of separate work sites employed by dozens of different contractors to win voluntary recognition from their contractor employers and then to negotiate area-wide agreements that apply to all contractor work on a market-wide basis. Uh, so newly acquired accounts by the contractors would come under the agreements um, uh, as, uh, uh, during the term of the agreements. They, these campaigns focused on both the contractor employers and their building owner clients. The union typically used trigger agreements in which the contractors agreed to implement car check recognition pro protocols for all of their work in a market once contractors performing a certain stated percentage, 55% or 60%, depending on the market, of the work uh, were bound by those agreements. And then the campaigns, these campaigns went through several phases. First, an initial fight, usually marked by strikes and disruption. Uh, to get contractors to, some contractors to negotiate actually the trigger. Then organizing other contractors to reach the trigger number, the 55 or 60 percent. Then implementing the car check, and then negotiating the master contract with those contractors that were, as a group, part of the whole trigger mechanism. And then a final phase after the contract was negotiated to organize the rest of uh, the, the market or the contractors who were not part of the initial group. The purpose of the trigger was to, in part, counter the contractor's realistic fear that they would lose business if they recognized the union before their competitors were organized. If the union could create so-called level playing field, then they would be better protected uh, from retaliation uh, by their building owner clients. But at the same time, the union ran a campaign to hold the building owners accountable for the workers' conditions even if the workers were employed by the contractors, which they were in most cases, and to create an environment in which owners would accept unionized contractors, meaning not terminate them, and would fund the higher wages and benefits that the union would negotiate uh, with the contractors, because ultimately the owners have to finance it however greedy the contractors are. They don't make enough money to actually pay for workers' health care unless they get it from their owner clients. The airport campaigns had a different strategy. We organized at Massport, LaGuardia, Newark, JFK, Philadelphia, Reagan, Dulles, Miami, Fort Lauderdale on an airport authority-wide basis. There were wheelchair workers, mobility assistants, line queue workers, terminal cleaners, airplane cleaners, security guards, baggage handlers, in that character, well, term basically passenger service workers. Um, unlike commercial office cleaners and guards, these workers shared a single airport work site. Maybe there were multiple terminals at that airport, but several work, site, uh, work sites. Um, and even if they were employed by different contractors, they had a mass location to gather. And they did in hundreds of thousands, hundreds and thousands, depending upon uh, which airport we're talking about. Rather than seek to negotiate economic standards with the contractors, 
The local fought for the airport operator, whether it was the Port Authority of New York, a bi-state authority, a city like in Philadelphia, or a county like in Miami, uh, Dade, to establish the minimum standards that apply to all workers at the airport, whether they were employed by the carriers, whether they were employed by union contractors, or whether they were employed by non-union contractors, or whether they were employed by sweetheart union contractors, of which there were quite a few. The government, um, the government was functionally equivalent to the building owner, at least space to the airlines, who hired the contractors who employed the workers. At the same time, the local won recognition from the contractors through a combination of car checks and NLRB elections after strikes and other public action, and negotiated airport standard contracts, all the different con uh, contractors with a, a multi-employer uh, worker bargaining committee uh, sitting together, um, that dealt with the non-economic issues and incorporated the uh, mandated government standards into the contract, providing an effective means of enforcement for what otherwise would be subject to the vagaries of public enforcement. These campaigns fused the political battle with elected officials and governing bodies with the fight against the airline carriers and the uh, employer contractors. Finally, the last category, uh, the residential work, uh, in, which was in New York City, where the union already represented some 25,000 residential workers. Everybody knows the prover proverbial door person on, um, uh, outside the buildings. Uh, the local organized to keep up with an expanding market. Typically, the work crews were small, about the size of a Starbucks, sometimes less than 10, rarely larger than 20. Through state and city laws, the local ensured that developers receive public, receiving public subsidies or benefits were required to pay their building service workers prevailing wages, which was the union standard. And that removed one of the biggest obstacles to organization, the owner's resistance to paying union rates, since they'd be required to pay those costs in any event. Private equity firms, uh, oh, and I should say, and the local has run more than 100 NLRB elections in co-ops and condos, each of which is a discrete employer, um, which was a radical break with the orthodoxy that I grew up with in the Justice for Janitors uh, methodology, showing uh, commendable flexibility uh, after protracted internal debate. Sorry. Um, Private equity firms controlled many of the contractors the union organized and who employed tens of thousands of workers across the country and more in some cases globally. These sectors were marked by increasing consolidation during this period, reducing the role of localized contractors and owners. And obviously everybody knows that airline consolidation following deregulation in 1978 meant that a handful of carriers effectively controlled the decision over which contractors were gonna be functioning in, the, in uh, each of the aero ports and up and down the coast. I want to emphasize that there was no secret special methodology underlying these campaigns. Uh, the core strategies have been developed during the 1980s and 90s by SEAU and other unions. Um, and they grew out of a recognition that in the contracted service sector, it was rational, as I said, for the contractors to fear that unionization would be bad for their business if their competitors were not also organized. Basic worker organizing, building committees, testing commitments, having strikes was at the core of these campaigns. But supported by so-called comprehensive or corporate campaigns directed at the primary and secondary employers, meaning the uh, building owners, uh, as necessary. These campaigns were protracted, often requiring years of commitment. In the New Jersey janitorial campaign, for example, it took almost a decade of constant organizing strikes and other collective action to organize 85% of the work in the market. In the New York, New Jersey airport campaign, it took a decade to organize the passenger service contracted workers and to raise the minimum standards from near minimum wage to $19 an hour plus employer paid health care. These campaigns overcame labor laws limits Building owners who effectively control the economic relationship but are considered, quote unquote, neutral, entitled to insulation from any, any underlying labor conflict, free to terminate their contractors on short notice for any reason, including that the workers organized. Contractors repeatedly violating the law, uh, firing workers, threatening them, the usual gamut of intimidation. At the airports, throughout the campaign, nobody knew which law, the NLRA or the Railway Labor Act applied and there were material implications for strategy and tactics because of that since both the two laws have different rules, both for representation and for when strikes are legally permissible. 
Organizing the guards, uh, 1947, Taft-Hartley, among other things, imposed a prohibition on so-called mixed unions, that is unions that are not only guards, like 32BJ, from using the NLRB election machinery in order to organize. And also, uh, NLRB case law has been for quite some time that guards, uh, before striking, have to give notice to their employers uh, in order that the employers can take efforts to protect their property and their people on their premises from destruction. So that had to be factored into a campaign methodology which uh, often used uh, quick strikes on short notice. Um, so lots of nuances, ups and downs I'm omitting in this accounting. This whole story was not foreordained and it almost never happened. I say that because 25 years ago, uh, the local, then with 50,000 members, was in decline. Its New York City base was eroding. It, low wage contractors with sweetheart unions were winning work. Uh, it was negotiating concessionary contracts. It had no organizing or political action program. And its autocratic and insular leadership, though challenged by a rank and file uh, opposition, remained in office. There was every reason to believe that the local would continue to lose power and membership. Then, in 1999, SEIU trusteed the local, appointed trustees, and imported staff with substantial organizing experience. This was just months after the prior leadership was reelected by a four to one margin. The new team brought a commitment to organizing, political action, and member participation, and was elected to local leadership when the trusteeship ended. So leadership change was the key first step. Next, SEIU also prompted the consolidation of multiple city-based East Coast uh, building service locals into 32BJ over the next 13 years. Several of those were trusteed in the process. The newly constituted regional local mirrored the increasing regional structure of the contractors and real estate interests, and it also brought together other staff and leadership with organizing experience and commitments. And those mergers were approved by membership votes. Structural realignment and consolidation fostered coordination, resource focus, and brought greater power to bear than the former separate city locals could muster. So that was key too. The new leadership built membership support for deploying union resources on growth. Members working for the same contractors in different markets understood that expanding organization increased their power in the already organized markets. The essential instability of contracted relationships sensitized BJ members to the need to remain on a battle footing. Today's union contractor can be replaced tomorrow with a non-union contractor. We've seen that with Twitter recently in San Francisco and in New York. Uh, organizing was celebrated, integrated into the union's overall work, not siloed. So political unity supporting the program was key even as the union grew and integrated uh, locals with different histories. Membership support took a variety of forms, and I think this is really important to emphasize. The union spent more than 20% of its post per capita dues receipts on organizing. In addition, SEIU returned a substantial chunk of the locals per capita taxes to support organizing. Together, this amounted to million, tens of millions of dollars a year as the local grew. It's paid for organizers, researchers, communicators, lawyers, lost time member brigades, um, et cetera. And this effectively meant less resources available devoted to quote unquote servicing uh, existing members. Executive board approved the budget and plan which was discussed at membership leadership meetings uh, throughout the union. The union, so resources. The union put its employer relationships at risk to further organizing. It pressured organized employers to agree to voluntary recognition in new markets or client sectors. Organizing demands were integrated into master contract bargaining. So if you're bargaining uh, the contract for the Philadelphia suburban cleaners, you put a demand for car check recognition in Wilmington, Delaware, as part of the campaign fight in, in, uh, in that part of the union. Um, Non-union workers organizing in new markets were integrated into the organized workers' contract campaigns. Members engaged in solidarity actions with organizing workers. Under BJ's cleaning contracts, members can honor picket lines without threat of discipline or replacement, including picket lines established by 32 BJ. Contractors, this is during contract term. Contractors resisting new market organizing face the threat of BJ picket lines in their already organized markets. 
Organizing security officers created tension with BJ's existing collective bargaining relationships with commercial building owners. The owners effectively paid the bills for the increased contractor labor costs. Organizing the guards meant, as a practical matter, increased building owner labor costs. Now we're taking money out of both pockets, not just one pocket in their pants. Um, the union put its political relationship risk at risk to further organizing. And I mean this in the most direct, blunt sense, uh, where you know the union president is on the phone with the governor of New York State, basically, in blunt language, telling him to go F himself. You know, uh, this was not, let's go out to dinner and have a drink. Um, for example, it demanded that elected officials use their authority as airport uh, operators to raise uh, worker standards. Union members joined non-union airport contractor workers in everything from civil disobedience to lobbying to petitions to hold elected officials to account for the airport workers' abysmal conditions. By emphasizing these institutional factors, I do not mean to minimize the essential role and leadership of the non-union workers who were organizing. Without that, no success was possible. Undertaking all forms of collective action, forging solidarity, making sacrifices, and running risks, they drove these campaigns. But their willingness to fight and to persevere would likely have remained untapped absent these institutional factors. And their likelihood of success was enhanced by the union's deployment of its resources broadly defined. I focus on these forms of solidarity for two main reasons this morning. First, as has been said, not only this morning, but for the last 30 years, the labor movement still has considerable resources at its disposal. And those resources should not be thought of as just money. Union members are and can be a powerful force if mobilized. And unions have all kinds of relationships with employers and elected officials that can be put in play in support of organizing in a variety of ways. I'm not suggesting that BJ's methodologies uh, should be mechanically applied in other organizing sectors, or even may be appropriate in new and different times. But it's imperative that union resources be brought to bear to support organizing. My second reason for stressing the important role of union resources, I'm almost done, and institutional commitment is some of the narrative, some of the friendly narrative accompanying the recent upsurge in what has been described as worker self-organizing or do-it-yourself organizing. And I should say that upsurge is exciting and inspiring and needs to be supported in every way possible. In some accounts, these efforts have been celebrated and differentiated from other union efforts because they are the product of the workers themselves without the assistance of unions. This, to my ear, echoes the typical employer anti-union rhetoric during organizing campaigns, that unions are third parties that stand in between the employer and the workers. Embracing that frame under the banner of authenticity is, in my view, short-sighted for several reasons. I'm almost done. First, when campaigns are successful and spread beyond a single employer location, there will, be a there will be a union which will not be able to function as a committee of a whole. There will be a need for structure and the challenges of operating on a scale necessary to win significant change from the employer. Second, the rhetoric implicitly endorses the notion that unions are not authentic representatives of the workers they represent, that workers may will in fact lack control over their own decisions if they unionize, et cetera. And that rhetoric will be used against these projects when they begin to take on a more structured institutional form. And finally, winning a contract that results in material gains may require a fight and significant resources beyond what the workers themselves command. At least that's been BJ's experience in many circumstances, even when our campaigns involve strikes or other, more, uh, other mobilizations. Bringing pressure to bear on employers, their clients, their investors in a variety of ways helps to offset the advantage that labor law gives employers uh, and can be a potent tool to support workers fighting for a union. Thank you. Thank you, that was great. We'll have plenty of time to talk about this in a little bit. Um, next, we're gonna hear from Kavitha Iyengar about um, university organizing, which has already been mentioned this morning, and specifically the UAW's piece of it. Hi, everybody. Um, so my paper and my talk today is about the UAW's interventions in organizing academic student employees and charts how the union strategies have helped to increase the represent 
representational density in the higher education sector, what um, Eric talked about is this new wave that's happening in higher ed organizing. Um, I argue that the UAW's efforts to transform academic student employee organizing and labor law in higher education was achieved via systematic industrial approaches to new organizing and striking. These successes laid the groundwork for the upsurge in academic worker organizing in recent years. First, there's important background to understand about the organiza organization of academic student employees in the higher education sector. Um, second, you have to look to the relationship and strategy of the UAW in the public and private sectors from the 1990s to, to, to today, a dual approach to the competing legal regimes that govern collective bargaining at institutions of higher education, and that this dual, I, I argue that this dual approach lended itself to transforming working conditions across the entire industry. And I conclude by looking to recent developments on the unsettled question of representation in the sector and that the key lessons are twofold. You need to have majority support for the union and you have to have a majority strike to really um, take on the challenging legal terrain of whether these workers are employees in the first place. Um, so a premise here is that in order to set industry standards, you have to represent the majority of the workers in a given sector. The UAW did this in the auto sector, right? In the heyday of the 30s to the 50s, the union came to represent the majority of auto workers in the country, winning strong contracts, setting standards for auto workers in the entire country, whether union or not, to compete in an economy where workers have choices over which employer they'll work for. When a union represents a major segment, if not the majority of the workers, non-union employers are forced to raise standards to meet union shop standards. Now, there are a lot of economic factors related to labor supply that I'm not talking about, but it's important to note that this argument turns on a fundamental idea, and the UAW's approach turned on this idea, that for a union to set standards for an industry, you had to represent way more people. So, for those who are familiar with organizing academic student employees, there have been recognized unions in the sector since the late 1960s. During the first phase of unionization, you can call it what you want, but from the 60s to the 90s, the American Federation of Teachers, the AFT, was the primary major union in the sector um, and organized the majority of the unions that became recognized. These were mostly public sector teaching assistants. These included unions at the University of Wisconsin, CUNY right here, Rutgers, University of Michigan, Oregon, Florida, lots of schools in Florida, um, New York, Kansas, lots of states, but public sector, right? So no academic student employees in the private sector were recognized, and they were suffering under legal decisions by the National Labor Relations Board that had denied student employees the right to organize. 1950 and 1951 in Columbia, 1972, Adelphi University. A few unions during this phase represented graduate student assistants who were working as researchers or took up more industrial approaches by organizing in job titles, um, across job titles. So that was here at CUNY, at Rutgers, and the University of Massachusetts. But everywhere else, it was just teaching assistants, just in the public sector. So these were two key strategic problems for actually achieving representational density. On the one hand, these employees weren't represented in the private sector. That's clearly a problem. But there was um, a potentially bigger problem, which is that graduate student employees don't just work as teaching assistants. A graduate student often works as a researcher. And at some universities, the vast majority of PhD students are researchers in the hard sciences, majority of them working on visas. All of these people were unrepresented. Now, these two problems from a legal perspective were related. In order to assess a graduate student assistant's employment status, rather than just applying a common law test for what's an employee, that's what happens for every other represented employee in the country, the board assessed what the graduate students were doing and said that you, you had to balance a student employee's services performed for their employer against the learning objectives and their educational relationship. And looking at these students' research apprenticeships, the board found that this relationship was educational, not one of an employee to an employer. This idea that students' employees' status as employees turned on what their role was with their employer um, was 
particularly vexing for those paid to perform research work. The primary, primarily educational relationship, I'm really trying to be loud and then it's worse. Um, the primarily educational relationship was less clear for graduate teaching assistants who rather than apprenticing under a supervisor as they perform research, were performing a teaching service to the university. Thus, all the while the private sector graduate assistants were unrecognized, those who were recognized in the private sector in the public sector were teaching assistants. And so these are you know, two main problems that needed to be addressed in order to grow density. In 2000, graduate student workers at, the, at New York University broke through the first problem, winning recognition of the private sector group of graduate assistants in the country, first time. They won their election, bargained their first contract. The board found that there was none of this dual relationship to preclude being an employee. However, when graduate students workers at Brown filed a petition in 2004, the board overturns that decision, decides that private sector graduate students were again not employees. Subsequently, NYU refused to bargain and negotiate an agreement with NYU, right? And so in 2010, 1,000 NYU graduate assistants filed an election again to try to get their union back, the union that they'd already won. The regional director of the NLRB says that um, they, in language very critical of Brown, that the graduate assistants are clearly performing services, they should be employees, but I had no authority to overturn Brown. And so the heeding this decision, then why you graduate students file a petition to overturn Brown. Then LRB agrees to review it, and in response to organizing pressure, a strike threat, and political pressure, NYU agrees to a neutrality agreement, re-recognizes the union, and withdrew its, um, and the union withdraws its petition. So I say this in order to deal with this legal challenge, right? They filed the petition, they had majority support, they had a strike threat, and we got a private sector union back. But this is still the only private sector union. So um, I tell the story of the University of California, which I think is really illustrative of these problems. So the largest number of graduate student workers were allowed to bargain in the entire country at the University of California, but only as teaching assistants. In 1999, and on a similar track to the NYU first decision, the um, labor board in California determined in a similar, similar analysis to the NLRB that the research assistants were engaged in this educational activity, not employees, but the teaching assistants were employees. And so the teaching assistants are allowed to bargain and it, only one of the problems exists, right? Only that the researchers aren't represented. So the UAW ran bills seeking to amend HERA in the state of California, that's the public relations, um, the bargaining statute for universities, trying to rid the statute of this balancing test that enabled the researchers to go unrepresented. While those bills failed, the UAW engaged in approaches to both organizing new workers who worked alongside graduate student researchers to build power on the shop floor that would ultimately be brought to bear for the researchers to win union recognition, most recently in 2021. So the first union of postdocs in the country was organized in 2007 and recognized in 2008. The University of California levied a series of objections, the union prevailed, and went on to organize academic researchers for the first time in the country in 2017, um, and succeeded to amend state law to allow graduate student researchers to unionize. Intervening in that period was the Columbia decision in 2016, which was landmark. Um, so what happens at Columbia is that, I'm not gonna do the whole legal analysis, but we're back to being employees. So the board holds that to treat student assistants, it has the authority to treat these people as employees, and we um, shouldn't understand um, that we should understand that the universities are controlling working conditions for all the workers, solving both of the problems, both the research problem and the private sector problem. Now, all that's the legal story, right, of whether or not workers have the right to organize. But in order to achieve the density I describe, the UAW also engaged in viable organizing strategies to protect these legal victories. So following this 2016 decision that graduate employees at Columbia were employees, Columbia still refused to bargain with the union. After 72% vote for the election and ultimately a majority strike, the union won recognition. Um, in the actual paper, we'll talk about the strike and what happened. Now, at the University of California, it was a similar story. 
After submitting a supermajority of authorization cards in the spring of 2021, the University of California, again, refused to recognize the 17,000 graduate worker unit of researchers at the university. Rather than heed the university's delay and deny tactics, um, after a majority had voted to support the union, after a thousand workers had asked a coworker to sign a membership card to authorize this union, a supermajority voted to authorize a recognition strike. And postdocs at the University of California authorized a sympathy strike. Now, the university agreed to recognize the union, but then again, in contract negotiations, attempted to roll back full recognition of all research employees. It was not until the 2022 UC strike that the university agreed to the recognition of all the fellow and trainee employees. Closer to home, workers at Rutgers University are voting on a tentative agreement that would similarly clarify and expand the bargaining unit to include all research employees, including research fellows. Now there's legal flux to date. UE filed a petition at MIT. There's a question of whether researchers compensated on fellowships in the private sector are employees under the act. Again, same questions. Um, the regional director says, look, we balance the student thing with this worker thing, and really they're students. Um, this is at, it's gonna be reviewed by the board again, hopefully. And what the key lesson is from all of this, from this changing legal regime, from this uncertainty in whether people are employees or not, is that it took majority support at each of these workplaces, worker-led committees, at having representative groups of workers in every department who are having people engaged in the fight to have a union and having real strikes, big strikes, to demand having a union and having rights. Um, that's all that there is in this shifting legal regime and it's very important to remember that that's the strategy that took 20 years to put in place and it's led to this huge outgrowth today of all these private sector unions in the country demanding recognition, which is very exciting and will lead to the higher density that will allow workers in the industry to actually have a say. Thank you so much. Um, so we have two stories of sort of top down plus bottom up here and then a slightly different version that we started with. Well, anyway, we'll get to that. First, we're gonna hear from Tammy Lee and Meita um, Tapia. Good morning, comrades. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you. Sometimes we sit in these rooms and then we'd get uh, really, really tired, right? Um, Tammy Lee, Rutgers, AAUP, AFT. Uh, present day, I'm here with also Maite Tapia. We're gonna talk about, um, well, you see the name of our, our talk, Black Worker, Black and Worker of Color Responses to Amazon's Policing Practices. We're gonna tell you about what policing means. Um, but how do I? Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Okay, we're gonna take a little, a slightly different, Tack to, to this question of what's new or new worker organizing. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about the Origin Project. We're currently, yeah, uh, we're currently involved in a nationwide study of uh, Amazon's practice of policing, which includes using off-duty police officers at uh, its facilities nationwide. Um, and the way that this came to me is that um, through Jobs with Justice, the RWDSU, the union in Bessemer, Alabama, right, reached out at looking for um, some scholars who could actually bring a critical race and intersectional lens to what's going on um, in Amazon's practices. Some of the st stories you've heard already, we know a lot about surveillance and, and the kind of technology Amazon has, but the question here, um, which started in Bessemer, is like when your facility is over 80% black, how do those practices go even deeper? How much more intense is it? So then when we think about worker responses to it, and when we think about what's a victory, and we think about whether or not it's new, we have to go deeper, right, and, and try to understand why are workers responding this way, uh, what are workers really wanting. So it started out with me um, 
RWDSU brought to me what they did, which I thought was really cool and innovative. They'd done public records uh, requests in every jurisdiction where Amazon had a fulfillment center. So we're talking about 300 facilities across the country. Um, and so we could see where Amazon was actually contracting uh, public off-duty police officers. And so we analyzed that data. I'm a qualitative researcher, Maite as well, so we had to bring on some quantitative people to look at that data. And a lot of you know uh, Sanjay Pinto and Ali Bustamante, who is at the Roosevelt Interview, uh, Institute. So all of us together are working on this nationwide study. We're not done yet, um, but we're gonna focus today on the Southern Black Belt. Um, we're going to try to tell a regional story about how Amazon's practices, which are bad for all workers, are really, really bad if you're black or you're immigrant or if you're a woman or, you know, all of the identities that matter in the greater political economy. So let me, let me get you into some quantitative findings. I'm just going to put this all up there. We have an academic paper that's under review. For those of you who are really into the academic stuff, we are fine sharing a draft with you, but what we really wanna do with this 15 minutes is bring the workers in the room. I think a lot of times we talk about workers, we talk about race, we talk about black people, but when you bring them in the room, you also have to deal not only with race, but with racism. Right, you could hear it in their voices. So we're gonna try to bring them literally into the room with some audio and hopefully that moves you in some way. But what did we find when we had the very narrow research question of Amazon's relationship with police and how they were using them during Bessemer? Um, we found when we looked at the quantitative data from the, 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 the public record searches that even though Amazon engages police, off-duty police across the nation, um, they are much more likely to use police in the Southern Black Belt, right? It's really important to understand that. Police are not great to be using during organizing campaigns ever, but when you are specifically in the Southern Black Belt, then we gotta look more deeply at why they're doing that. I highlighted Alabama and North Carolina because we're gonna report out about Bessemer and another uh, facility, Garner, North Carolina. Um, we also found that in the South, uh, Amazon is much more likely to use police for um, security as opposed to uh, traffic control. So already you're getting a feeling of like dehumanization, criminalization, et cetera, when you use these sort of tactics in a facility that is over 80% black. Okay, so. Um, Maite and I write a lot together, um, and we consider ourselves critical uh, race and intersectional theory people. Um, we're sort of developing a camp of research that we call critical industrial relations. And I, I'm, I'm saying this now because I want to bring into the room that um, it changes the original traditional IR questions or industrial relations questions that we ask when we ground it in critical race theory. Right, it changes what do workers do when you actually give it historical context and then engage in storytelling and finding counter narratives to why workers are organizing. And that has implications, of course, for whether or not we think this moment right now is new or is this a continued fight for democracy and full participation in the country, right? So um, I bring that to the forefront. Um, when we brought critical race theory to try to understand these practices in the South, we obviously, by listening to the workers, had to expand our definition of policing. It's no longer just about uh, Amazon having a couple police officers in their cars with their lights going in full, um, you know, in full gear, which is bad, but also the workers are talking, they're using language, we're gonna show you plantation, slavery, prison, Right, we're in the South. Bessemer, Alabama is an all black suburb of Birmingham. It's literally a couple miles from the site of a former plantation. So these are living histories that are living in black people and when you're in the South, you really feel it, right? And so we put some images up here. Also, you know, this was during the first two campaigns at Bessemer, you know, we also in the background have the George Floyd situation happening and you've got Amazon using police in this way. Um, and so it was very important for us to understand that policing is bigger than just police officers. It, it brings us back to how police and the military were used during reconstruction 
in that area, right? And that that's very, uh, very much alive in the bodies of the people that we're studying. So again, Bessemer, Alabama, um, the, the workers are, of course, uh, organizing through RWDSU, an established regular traditional trade union. Garner, North Carolina was an independent union uh, called CAUSE. Um, there have been some changes in the structures. They, um, and, and I want to highlight this for a second, because sometimes we look at Bessemer and we think, even though that election is still uh, pending, right? They haven't lost yet, let's say it that way. Um, we sometimes look at that as like, oh, they haven't won, so they lost. And we're looking at an NLRB election. We are talking about a group of workers who routinely fall outside of the NLRA or outside of union organizing, right? So these are worker responses. We're very, very intentional about that language. But RWDSU and CAUSE now have, um, you know, relationships. They work with each other. Um, Cause was founded because they were inspired by the black workers in Bessemer. Whether or not that election was won or not, that's a victory. So I want us to start thinking bigger about what we call a win and what we call a loss. Um, so the identity lenses that we're using here, Bessemer, this was over 80% black um, facility. So we're also looking at issues of gender. How does it differ? Not all black people are the same. How was this even more amplified for women? Um, in Garner, North Carolina, there were a couple other identities that were very important for understanding worker responses and the way that they're organizing. So not just race, because this is also prim primarily black, but there's a substantial Latinx community, most of them like Venezuelan immigrants who you know are coming from a different political situation than the black American workers. We'll talk about why that was difficult in terms of organizing. Um, gender and then disability. And I, I'll focus here for a second on the fact that Amazon is getting subsidies for hiring folks with disabilities, black folks with disabilities, in some cases formerly incarcerated black folks with disabilities. They're getting public relations, marketing, but also actual subsidies from the city, right? And then failing to accommodate. So when we talk about, again, Amazon failing to accommodate people with disabilities, also think about race, also think about uh, immigration status, and we'll see like how intense these routine practices by Amazon are. Um, so a lot of centering of storytelling of workers. So we embedded ourselves in these communities. We, we have a whole team. We've got graduate students who we leave there for months at a time to sort of make sure they're working side by side with the workers and understand what other organizations, what other parts of the movement are these workers connected to. Um, secondary data, of course, is a lot on Bessemer. Right? We can go to the NLRB records, we can go um, to newspapers, et cetera. But secondary data is important, but really our primary data is talking to workers themselves and then bringing them to you. Um, so I'll just put our findings up here really quickly and I'll take you through Bessemer and then I'll have Maite take you through, um, yeah, do you need this? Uh, so intensive surveillance, we all know this, right? A lot of you in the room have worked really hard on understanding uh, Amazon's A to Z app, the way in which they're constantly having workers on video and technology. There was this technology during COVID where they could actually see when workers got closer than six feet to, get to each other. Those of you who are on the Athena table, I see you in the room, you told us about that, right? So we already know about Amazon's intense surveillance which impacts all workers. But when we talk to workers and listen to their language, black workers, we're adding to that surveillance culture, actual police at the facility, right? And private security and also internal loss prevention people, right? And then you add to that what we're calling plantation style management. We did not create that as a concept of course, but it's very much happening right now in Amazon fulfillment centers. They're basically modern plantations, right? And the, the workers see it that way. This is not our language, it's theirs. Uh, I lost that, okay. Um, so, and then racialized employment practices. So this is the typical stuff we would think about in terms of racism, right? You got an 80% black workforce in Bessemer and then you've got an all white management team. Right, and so that creates a situation um, that doesn't require intentional discrimination, right? 
Okay. So I wanted to, again, I talked a lot about the workers. We want to bring, if we can get this audio played, um, the, we put the script up there for those of you who, who can benefit from that in terms of accessibility. Um, and what you're going to hear here, one second, um, is our interview with one black worker, middle-aged black man, um, talking about how he felt in that environment with a very young white uh, supervisor talking to him in a way. Um, well, let me let him let me let me let him tell you himself. I know I had a, since you said that, I know I had an incident with a, with a PA, and I felt like he was racist because I bet I, she told me I, I, I went back to him and told her. Mm -hmm. uh, my machine was down, mm -hmm. and it was broke, and they need to fix it. And so by the time someone came over there and fixed it, she had to take me, she told me to log off my machine, and she told me to go to stand up when she put me on another machine. So by the time she told me that, the guy fixed the machine. Mm -hmm. So I asked her, can I well, can I just stand my machine now since they already fixed it? Mm -hmm. She said, no, I'll just go do what I told you to do. Wow. In that tone? In that tone, and that made me mm -hmm. feel, I'm gonna tell you exactly the way it made me feel. Let me tell you. Know, like, Nick will get back to that machine like I told right. you. That's, right. oh my God. And then when I thought that, it was another little female walking beside me. And I and I thought, I looked at her, then I, I looked back at her, and I kept walking, and yeah, something told me, no. So I bad back and let her, I bad back and let her call up with me. Mm -hmm. And I said, and I said, I ain't know her name. I said, what you just told me, how you just came at me? I took that racist and I ain't like that. Mm -hmm. She said, well, if you, uh, if you took it like that, I didn't mean to say it like that. I said, how you meant it? Because mm -hmm. mm -hmm. when you told me, and I told her exactly how I felt, I said, I felt like you just told me, get back, nigga, get back at this station. Yeah. Do what I told you to do. Right. Okay. So those of us who are black folks in the room recognize tone policing like that, right? Um, the reason why I wanted to show or play that clip is that it shows simultaneously this racialized practices that Amazon does, but it also shows the power of talking back to a white person in the South, right, about the way they're talking to you. Um, and there's some power in that, like workers are really responding in ways in which um, are super, super exploitative, but there is still autonomy and agency in people, right? And so talking back to a white supervisor in the South is not a thing that we do without consequence. And I really want us to understand that when we talk about the ways in which people are exploited, we also can't erase the ways in which they are standing in their power. Okay. Okay, so I'm not gonna, we, in the interest of time, there's also a lot of quotes, and again, if you want the paper, we can give it to you and you can see the power of what people are saying. But again, this is just Bessemer, Alabama, showing you how people feel about having all white management, right? So Amazon can say all it wants, it is not doing this intentionally, but when you focus on the workers in terms of their identity, this is also happening. Right? So all whites in management, the plan is 90% African American. When a white new hire comes in, I give them two to three months and they're moving up. Right? So part of the racialized employment practices is that they use black workers to train their young white soon to be supervisors, right? Outside of a plantation site. Um, and there are a couple, again, these are just to show you the kind of language workers are using feeling like a prison. Uh, we got slaves out there and they're policing them. Again, just paying attention to their language tells you something about the oppression. Um, this image I put up here because there were literally hundreds of workers who had similar signs. This is in Bessemer. This was part of their union uh, campaign. Uh, but they asked everyone to write why they are voting yes for a union. And I want you to be, understand that it's almost never wages hours, working conditions, of course they complain about those things, but this is about dignity and humanity and democracy. On those signs you see, I don't wanna feel like 
a slave on a corporate plantation. Slavery is over, give us what we deserve. So again, if we're talking about, and Sarita's in the audience, and I, I love that because we talk, when we say what's new about organizing, we're talking about whole worker organizing. And so this is about not just workplace democracy in the workplace at the enterprise level, but it's also about dignity, humanity, democracy at large. And if we think about if that's what workers are organizing for, is this a new moment or is this the same moment uh, at a new time? And just very quickly, Maite, you want to finish up? I'm sorry, I took all the time, but 15 minutes is short. Sorry. Don't clap. We're not done. <laughs> so I just heard I have one minute to finish up. <laughs> but this was great timing, and I love, of course, uh, doing this work with you. I'm, um, so I want to just also highlight some um, of the things we learned um, when going to Garner, North Carolina, a um, very similar kind of a sense of militarization, essentially, of um, the employment relations. Um, at the same time, also, we asked a lot of people, so why do you work at Amazon? Um, and there was kind of this contradiction in which people sometimes felt like, I'm really happy that Amazon is giving me this job. Um, we heard that, for example, from um, immigrants from Venezuela, while at the same time also realizing that they are an oppressor. So seeing Amazon as savior and oppressor. Um, Tammy already mentioned, for example, the issue of disability, that Amazon is getting a lot of subsidies for certain uh, groups of people, and then essentially is, is failing to accommodate them. Um, the migration status is another uh, kind of identity that, they try, that Amazon essentially is trying to exploit, and that we then also see the challenges for kind of worker um, organizing. Um, so let me just also move to some of the quotes again that to bring the workers in the room. So this is about um, a, a black worker at Garner who talks about essentially the racism that he experiences every day growing up in the South, but in a way maybe didn't expect this to happen also at a very progressive company as he thought, like Amazon. So he's saying, um, you know, he's reminded of that racism, you know, they, they had the sign, sign, welcome to KKK country, um, but then, you know, when I go to work, I'm not expecting to be treated like that, but that's what I feel. I see the racism, I see the policing, I see the exploitation. Another worker also told us again about that kind of racial tone um, uh, policing and uh, between uh, uh, managers um, and the workers. So one of the managers, he, he told us, you know, he, he said, I know this person is just extremely racist. You know, living in the South, you've been around systemic racism all your life, you smell the stench of racism. And so it was again about the way the manager addressed him, saying something like, um, you have to do this, and then using the words, you're not going to comply, you're not going to co uh, comply, you're not going to comply. So then the worker was like, well, are, am I at work or am I, or am I in some kind of detention uh, center? Um, and finally, and of course we have a lot more quotes, but we just wanted to give you some examples or a snapshot of what we're hearing from the workers. Um, so in terms of the accommodations, um, blind associates, for example, that they don't know how to get in the building and then need help from um, other workers as to where to go. Um, but of course, if you don't do your work in time, you get reprimanded, you get uh, written up. If you get written up too many times, you get um, let go, essentially you get fired. Uh, another person you know, was in a wheelchair, wasn't able to make the race, um, and then gets a write-up for underperformance, but essentially didn't get the right accommodation, so obviously couldn't do the, the work he was um, um, said he had to, um, or they said he had to do. Um, and then again, that sense of like coming to prison, um, and there were, we talked to formerly incarcerated workers who said, you know, in the beginning I was happy that Amazon offered me a job. It's, it's very easy in a way to get into Amazon and get a job, but then once I got there, I felt like I'm back in prison essentially. Um, so what does all this mean and what does all this mean in terms of uh, future organizing work or organizing etc is that as Tammy already mentioned we might want to think differently also what we consider a win um, and and what is not a win because when we talk to the workers it's it's very impressive uh, to hear essentially their power and their courage to to step up against you know a, a company like Amazon or against some of these um, managers in the first place um, at the same time we also realize the many challenges um, for worker organizing. For example, when we talk to some of the Venezuelan workers, they often blamed it on the black workers on site as to why things weren't going well. So that's a huge challenge for the workers and unions to kind of uh, build solidarity across the different groups. Um, 
And then, of course, we want to again highlight the book by uh, Erica Smiley and Sarita Gupta on <laughs> whole worker organizing. Um, and I think Keith, actually, from the uh, Union of Southern Service Workers, mentioned this yesterday as well in the session about that importance um, of um, uh, thinking about the whole worker and intersectional organizing and essentially understanding that what happens to workers um, on the job is intimately connected, of course, to what is happening in their community, in their school, uh, in their lived environment, and it's also connected to their gender, their race, their uh, ethnicity, ability, and migration status, etc. So that means that when we think about organizing, organizing needs to happen at the intersection um, of these identities as well as um, lived experiences. So thank you very much. Okay, you're going to hear that perspective um, both from Sarita Gupta on the next session and also from Ben Wilkins from the Southern Service Project. So um, that will, we will have plenty of time to explore later. But now is your chance, those of you who've come here today, um, to ask questions, offer comments um, for the four presentations that you've just heard. And um, we're going to, since we don't have that much time, I'm going to ask everyone to keep their questions as concise as possible so that everybody who wants to speak gets a chance. Um, who has the microphone out there? No one? Is there a roving mic somewhere? Or we'll have to, I don't think that one works. People could come up here if not. Um, who would like to go first? Um, thanks, Stephanie. And could you identify yourself, please? Yeah, go for it. But Hello? use the mic. Hi, thank you so much. Um, my name is Justine Medina. I uh, work at JFK 8, and I organize with the Amazon Labor Union. So I just I really appreciated the last presentation, and I would love to, to read your paper. Um, it's, it's just a quick comment that I really do believe that every labor organizer should get a job at Amazon, at a fulfillment center, just for a week, just to see what it's like. Because, it, you know, the... Um, conditions described are, are really at every fulfillment center. I mean, there are no windows in there. It, it feels like a literal prison when you go inside. You cannot go inside without badging in. There's security guards everywhere. Um, it's, I mean, it's it's a horrifying uh, feeling to work there. So I think to to really grasp that, I think people should should consider applying to fulfillment centers. Um, but then I did, I just wanted to comment that I think it's very interesting the, the sort of salience of the consciousness in the South, because even though you do see these similar conditions against the like black workers in the North, like I, I haven't really thought about how that, that sort of slavery consciousness really does carry through. And so the, the, the potency to organize at Amazons in the South, I guess, sort of really is, is stronger because of that. And I think that's really interesting. So I just wanted to highlight like, thank you for that, and that's all. Do we reset? Um, we're going to collect a few questions, actually, so if you could just hold off for a second, that would be great. Who wants to go next? How about back here? Hi, Peter Fugil, postdoc at Rutgers. Um, question mainly for Larry. Uh, you focused in your presentation on how 32BJ um, supports organizing within the core industries where you're already represented. Could you talk about how you support organizing in other industries, particularly with the fast food justice campaign? Um, just one second. We're, we'll take one more and then you'll get a chance. We just don't have that much time. Please. Yeah. Hi, I'm Xiang. I'm a CUNY graduate student. I, uh, I want to ask a question about higher education graduate student unionizing because we see the divide actually in the UC campaign that many international students and also people color migrant to vote no and the, the term, I mean the final result is seems so weird because more, like more than thirty percent I forgot a number. So you see even the, the in the revolutionary the higher education graduate student organizing they're still, still very divided with the union. So I want to know how I mean how you think about this situation and also uh, Professor Eric Brink, how we think about this issue? Yes, how to, yeah, I mean, how to theorize or how to uh, think about the, the divide within the union, the graduate student union, yeah, sorry. Okay, great, so um, do we have a microphone up here that works? That, that, um, 
Yeah. We're going to start with Tammy, I believe, for the first question. I'll reserve a bunch of time for, for those folks to answer those questions directly. I just wanted to say that the sister from JFK 8, um, thank you so much. We would love to talk to you. If there is a regional difference in the way black workers are talking about the same oppression, right? So in the South, they're more likely to say plantation and slavery. Um, and if we talk about JFK 8 or if we move to New York, New Jersey area, people talk about prisons. Right, and it's not as embedded uh, in the slavery plantation sort of thoughts, even though that's that's what occur that's what what's occurring, arguably. Right, so we'll talk to you about it. I would love to do that. Uh, I'm trying to get a job at an Amazon fulfillment center, so, um, but I I I agree with you. We all have to do that, right, to, to try to understand at least a little bit what the workers um, are going through. So we're in that process. Thank you. Think this is working? Yeah, um, yeah. I, I plan to talk a lot more about the democracy that's happening in the sector. I I think of the disagreement as a feature of participation at levels that aren't really common in a lot of unions right now, and it's really exciting to have a lot of people engaged in participation and debate. That's to me union democracy, and I think that's a really strong feature. I think there's like a lot of work to do in these huge workplaces to build meaningful structures for workers to engage in this debate and democracy at scale. And I think that's a huge um, moment of growth and potential improvement <laughs> to happen across the entire sector, because I don't think it's stable. And I think it's, there is all this upsurge happening in all these different workplaces, and it's really exciting. And participation at this level is really, really important. And having ways for people to participate in the democracy of the workplace is what I think is part of what we're doing when we're forming unions. And so uh, there's going to be disagreement. And the question is, how do we take disagreement to come together to fight the boss? Because that's what unions do. Just, uh, I, I agree with what you said. I'll, I'll leave it at that. At 32 BJ actually represents a lot of university employees and contracted workers. Can you speak up, please? 32 BJ actually represents uh, lots of higher ed workers, both directly employed by uh, the university as well as subcontracted. And I think, um, and they can be difficult employers uh, to fight. Uh, they're bureaucratic, uh, they're rigid, they're self righteous, um, they don't admit to the sort of core monetary incentives that cleaning contractors are not ashamed of, you know, uh, uh, saying is their reason for being. Um, and it's exciting for us, I think, or for the union, to see this level of academic organizing with other categories of workers to envision a way, and maybe some of this happened at Rutgers, um, in which, um, you know, there can be the universe of, uh, of people who contribute to that employment situation or that environment, figuring out a holistic strategy so that we don't end up having advances in one area come at the expense of workers in another area, that the solidarity of the entire collected workforce, regardless of the number of different types of employers they may have on that facility, uh, find a level of unity. You know, just a little anecdote about Rutgers. When we were organizing the janitors in New Jersey, we went to organize um, the janitors uh, at Rutgers. And um, Rutgers uh, fired the contractor because the workers were organizing. Now, a private sector employer can do that uh, and actually not be held liable under the labor law. Um, but a public employer is subject to the Constitution, theoretically. And we brought a 1983 action against Rutgers uh, for interfering with the workers' freedom of association, and we actually won. And then Rutgers retaliated by insourcing the work uh, at a lower standard than we were fighting for. So, I mean, these, the, the, the employer uh, structure, as my sister says here, is evolving, it's uh, never stable, and it responds to struggle to find new forms in order to thwart uh, creating an equitable setting. Um, so on that, on the brother's question, 
you know, we've spent a lot of effort both raising the minimum, fighting to raise the minimum wage in all the markets we were in, fighting for, I, I hate to use these words, but, you know, sort of class-wide um, initiatives that benefit not just our members, but actually they do benefit our members' families and other uh, low-wage workers and all their workers in general. Um, and, you know, we worked very closely um, uh, with the, in terms of in New York City with the Taxi Limousine Commission to fight along with the Taxi Worker Alliance and others to implement uh, minimum wage standards and other uh, regulation of the drivers uh, and to contain the number of, uh, of cars that could be on the street at the same time uh, with the freelancers union with, with a variety. So, I mean, we sort of see ourselves, even though you say within our core sectors, but the reality is our core sector is low-wage workers um, who happen to be in the markets that we function, 90% people of color. Um, and so, you know, you can look at it as a sectoral thing or you could look at it as a function of the way employment is structured in this country at this time. Um, so I don't know if that answers your question. Okay, we have a bunch more people who want to speak. We'll start with you and then, <clears throat> then move across the room. You'll be Hi. Here. Thanks to everyone. Y'all were great. And, uh, and uh, Eric's uh, – yeah. uh, my name is Scott Heiferman. I um, especially liked Eric's presentation, um, and I'm so curious about this rise of DIY unionism. I think it's a very important, important topic. And, and so my question real quickly, really to anyone who wants to pick it up, is um, – you know, he pointed out this uh, this age age difference, 60s, 20s. Um, can you speak to? I mean, can you get to like a, a raw, real deal about the cultural things going on? Not you know within within the world of unions and beyond, and how it relates to the the culture clash that we're like we're experiencing. A, and I'm not just talking about age. I mean, we're in a uh, a culture war. Last thing I'll say is, you know, I, 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 to be addressed as comrade, I am 1,000% behind the, I mean, I'm dreaming of a rise of unions and the impact it can have on, on, on the economy and the culture and society, and I want that, and I want that. But I'm uncomfortable with being addressed in, with that word because I don't think it's going to win. I don't think it's going to win in, 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 in winning over our whole country toward this way. So, like, tell me I'm wrong, um, but let's get into it. Like, what's, like, how do we really see this rise? Uh, because I, I don't see anyone in their 20s or 30s. Anyway, I'll shut up now. Thank you. I think what the conversation in the room is different than in the wider world, but anyway, yeah. Hi. I've, hello. Uh, Thanks, everyone, for your presentations. Um, I'm Alex Press. I'm Jack Ben's labor reporter. Um, my question is particularly for Eric. Um, so I sort of agree with Larry um, on DIY unionism. I think I want to, like, push you to defend that this is actually different um, than unionism, period. Because um, I think, one... There's a, you not to, I'll use comrade because I think it's a good word. Um, you know, Justine and her comrades in the ALU definitely do something distinct. Um, that is an independent unionism with real distinct features. Um, but I think otherwise, a lot of these things that are kind of labeled, and I think probably, I, I mean, you're the one who who's, has the book that I haven't read yet, so I can't say for sure. But I think a lot of these things historically are just what unions, union militants did. Um, and so it feels ahistoric. It feels like it reifies a kind of misidentification of these activists, who many of whom don't know this history, right? So they don't realize what they're doing is just unionism. Um, and I do worry that it kind of, um, to Larry's point, uh, also is exactly what the employer says. Um, it kind of reinforces their argument about what unions are. Okay, David, and then there was someone over here. You'll be next, and then we'll take some responses. Yeah. Um, I David Kranz, um, recently retired from a 40-year career in 1199. Um, my, my question is very, it's actually a very specific one to, to Eric. I really like the presentation. It's very, to me, very, been very exciting seeing what's been happening at Amazon and Starbucks, and there may be more DIY stuff that I don't know about. But my question is, how uh, do you or do people who have really been working on these campaigns envision the actual winning of a first contract? 
Um, and I, I don't mean that as a, as a criticism. I just, it's a real question. Uh, in my very old-fashioned way, I, with Amazon, I just think they have to be able to have the ability to strike. But that may be uh, not creative. I don't know. But it, I, you know, that, so I, that's my question. How do we get the first contract? This woman over here is next, and then we'll, we'll do another round. We'll, Thank you. We'll save you for the next one. All right. Hi, I'm, uh, is this, you can hear me? All right, I'm Jennifer Klein, and I have a um, question that uh, is about higher education, but also really a legal um, kind of question for Larry and for Eric. I, I think that a lot of the discussion in terms of unionism um, in higher education, uh, uh, not only seems to leave out the faculty, but is assuming um, the public sector. And so for those of us who are at private sector universities, why are we still blocked by this yeshiva decision? Because my university brings in all kinds of corporate executives. We, we now have the, these multiple positions of vice president of such and such, and they've all come from corporations. We have no access to any decision-making power. Forget decisions over the budget. We don't even have access to the data about the budget. So um, so I want to you know, ask about why we're not talking about how we break through that, that barrier. And then to the kinds of stories that um, Eric was talking about, how you have these um, college-educated young people who are now seeking unionization, um, you know, I've talked to some of them, and they said, you know, they find that what happens is because of this narrow restriction of who's in the bargaining unit, that the top management will suddenly label them as your middle management, you know, um, you're because you're kind of a professional worker, so you're middle management, and you can't really be in the bargaining unit, and so they then spend all of this time just fighting the fight to get people to be recognized as workers in the organization. So I wonder if you can just put together those two um, kind of ultimately, um, you know, kind of legal barriers to getting something going. Thanks, Jennifer. So um, let's have some quick responses because we are almost out of time, and then we'll have one more round. Um, I think Eric is probably the one to go first. And so sure. Can we'll you hear me? Um, so first, uh, in response to Alex, uh, you know, I, I explicitly argued that worker-to-worker -worker organizing isn't new, right? And so I just want to reiterate that worker-to-worker -worker organizing isn't new, but most unions aren't doing it. And so again, so like the data is really clear. The vast majority of unions haven't even had OCs uh, since like 1980. So, so most unions aren't doing good rank-and-file organizing. And my argument, therefore, is that one of the things that's dif differentiating the new wave is that these types of rank-and-file organizing practices, which as I explained, are old, uh, are actually being implemented at scale for the first time in a long time. So that is new. And there's a qualitative difference, though, even between like the, the new drives. And again, people only talk about ALU or Starbucks, but there's a much wider uh, kind of range of new phenomena that group under DIY unionism, you know, the graduate student efforts, the News Guild. Um, these are different because you have workers training other workers to unionize. That's different. That isn't the same that like Unite Here, CWA in the past was doing. And so we're looking at new models that are explained by the, some of the things that I've talked about that have an ability to scale. And nobody has yet explained how like the traditional structure-based unionizing in the way that I still think is good in you know, how, I was, how I was trained and is good in a lot of contexts can scale if you don't give more power into the hands of workers to initiate drives and to lead their own campaigns. And that's new, and I would challenge others to argue what the alternative is to organize the big corporations that control the vast majority of the resources and the workforce. The second point is on the youth. Yeah, this is a, it's a real, it's a real generational uh, discussion, um, not just because young workers are more like radical and more interested in taking risks, but because people have been in the labor movement for a long time who are really good and oftentimes very radical have, uh, you know, have, are very uh, subjected to the experience of having defeated over and over and over again for decades. And that's reasonable. It's reasonable to generalize from your experience, but that makes you risk averse. And I find it, frankly, like baffling that after a pandemic, after the best NLRB we've had since 1938, and after the most uh, tightest labor market we've had in decades, that there's very little difference in what national labor unions are doing 
compared to what they were doing pre-2020. You will, it was very hard to find a major shift with a couple of exceptions of people adjusting to the new moment. And that is a huge missed opportunity. And we need to call out that missed opportunity and we need to like try as soon as possible before the momentum is dissipated by union busting and a recession to try to push through our own organizing and to you know, plead with people who have resources to put real resources to our new organizing. This goes to the last question, which is, um, how do you win a first contract? The first thing, I'll just repeat, is a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you wait out this moment and say, well, they're not going to win a first contract, you know, like, you know, we're proven right. It's inconceivable that you're going to be able to win at scale unless unions start actually putting significant amount of resources to new, re to, uh, new organizing. And the research is clear that there is money, right? There's billions. Where, actually, I have to look at Bunner's research. There's a lot. There's millions, I think billions of dollars in the uh, coffers that aren't being used for new organizing. And so the question then is, will unions give the solidarity necessary to support efforts like at Starbucks? So that, for instance, it would walk through what a campaign there would look like to win a first contract. You can scale up more stores, and you could have in the stores that aren't yet unionized, what if you have strikes at the stores that are unionized with a national boycott in which every union is picketing their local stores to help reinforce a strike? And we don't know whether that would win. We don't know. But if you're not able to take those types of risks, then it's very unlikely you're going to have ever to turn around uh, the union density to decline. If not now, like when are you actually going to do it? Um, I'll just note on the faculty question, I think faculty should unionize. Um, and I think it's a similar situation that graduate student workers were in less than a decade ago, that graduate student workers also didn't have the right to organize. And what made the difference was a plan to get majority support of faculty um, at strategic work sites and to change the law through organizing, not through a court case. The challenges I'm facing is knowing when to pull back, having been a staff organizer, uh, and leaving the organizing task to the workers in the workplace. I'm working on five different campaigns for EWOC. Uh, and I'm finding that outside of an institutionalized union structure, it's a lot slower. It's a lot more challenging. Um, I'm finding that when I'm missing with the, without the backing of an institutionalized union is I'm finding I'm constantly having to do an educational process on my own with the workers in terms of what their rights are and labor history. And I think that that's a piece that's missing in the, DY, uh, in the direct organizing with the rank and file that the union provides. I'm not saying it's necessary, but I see that that's what's missing is the support. Uh, and also there's a lot of stop and starting with these small little units. There's a lot of dedication, but it takes a lot of motivation on the part of the workers themselves. And I find that that's a real struggle. I, I wish I'm, we had more time. Uh, this is a fight. It's, you know, it's not easy. Um, it's uneven. I agree with, with what the brother says that, you know, I hate to say I was with, in the AFL when Sweeney first took over, and we were all saying spend your money and getting the AFL, which has no power of the affiliates, and getting the national unions, which don't want to mess with their locals, and, and the locals have most of the money, is a challenge. So, you know, hopefully the workers will move, create tension, have people see opportunity, uh, and, um, you know, there will be a change. Um, but, you know, getting into tradecraft is worthy and important so we don't have people frustrated, turned off, and cynicism built and demoralization that follows. But I think the main theme, which I agree with everybody here, is this is a moment there is uh, precarity being created for new categories of workers, there is a proletarianization going on. I think the doctors are going to be the next people to organize because they've lost complete control. They're all getting bought out by these huge health systems, and they have high regard for themselves. Uh, and they're like the, the craft, the artisans of the 19th century who are losing control over their craft and are being, in a sense, de-skilled. You've got 15 minutes. Hurry up. Get the next one in. Don't ask any follow-up questions. So, Just like here. Yeah, so... <laughs> anyway, I'm not trying to filibuster the time, but... Tradecraft is not going to solve our problems. Social movements are going to solve our problems. Unions have to do what they're supposed to do. If more of them did it, there would be a spark. More success breeds more success. 
Victory breeds confidence. Confidence brings more willing to take risk. And, um, you know, that's what we need. Um, and more perspectives that help people uh, be more effective and more nimble. And I'll let other people talk for once. Okay. Do you guys want to wrap up and just for a minute? Or oh, so we're going to end on the culture war wars Whatever. question? Whatever. Okay. So... I appreciate the question because I think it highlights a major thing that's happening right now, right? You say um, we're at culture wars, but depending on who you talk to, we were born into culture wars, our ancestors were in culture wars, and this is not uh, a new fight for some of us. So I guess what I would say to you, whether we say comrade or not comrade, is what are we fighting for? Who's the we? And what are we going for? For some people, for a lot of people, especially if you're in a marginalized group, you're going for dignity, humanization, and democracy. So a lot of that has anti-capitalism in it. It has abolition democracy language. A lot of us were trained in terms of fighting for social justice in those disciplines and approaches to transformation. And so to me, it's like, can we win at the bargaining table when we use comrade? Okay, but do we win freedom if we talk more radically and, and, and aim at structures? Absolutely. I don't know how we get free without breaking some of the institutions that are creating the subordination. So for some of us, that language is very easy because we come from traditions in which uh, anti-capitalism and abolition are part of our survival. And I could see for others where they wouldn't plug in that way. But if we're going to build an intersectional movement, that means we got to figure out who should we peg, uh, whose, whose version of what we're fighting for should be the center of the organizing campaign and whether or not we have a victory or not. Right? Okay. That's the perfect note to end on. Thank you so much to all our panelists. Please join me in thanking them all.